so he, you have an amazing experience working with uh, WHO, with Gavi, uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and especially as a director of the Children Vaccine Program. Uh, so we are all uh, looking forward to hearing you around preventing cancer with vaccines 2017 status. So Mark, please. <coughs> Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, and uh, uh, Jacques Louis, who, a, a colleague of mine for many, many years uh, who's uh, involved with this, inviting me. Thank you very much. I'd like to talk about um, preventing cancer and uh, s a few other uh, supposedly non-communicable diseases with vaccines, give you the status of our control measures in uh, 2017 and try to uh, um, a list for you the uh, major issues that remain in terms of controlling these diseases through vaccines. The, um, um, a lot of people don't know, including the, the public, the media, and even people in the uh, cancer control community are not even aware that a substantial proportion of cancers are actually caused by infectious diseases and some of those uh, vaccine-preventable infectious diseases. Um, there's about 14 million uh, new cases of cancer in the world uh, reported in 2012, and about 15% of those cancers are caused by um, uh, infectious diseases. The most prevalent is uh, uh, Helicobacter pylori, mostly causing stomach, but other cancers as well. Um, but also uh, the human papillomavirus, the hepatitis B virus, the hepatitis C virus, uh, EBV, and some other uh, viruses cause a considerable amount of, um, let's see how we move this forward. Whoops, I'm sorry. In fact, about 16% of uh, human cancers are caused by infectious agents uh, this is much lower in low-income countries, um, uh, and, and uh, in low-income countries, a lot more proportion of their cancer is actually due to infectious agents. And this is probably an underestimate, since uh, cancer registries in developing countries are notoriously poor. But some uh, developing countries do have pretty good cancer registries, and uh, from that we can... Um, uh, guess that about 30 to 50 percent of cancers in Africa are probably due to infectious agents. Um, the, um, many of these cancers are caused by oncogenic viruses with some interesting similarities. First of all, uh, in these uh, diseases, cancer is not a primary feature of these diseases. In fact, uh, some authors refer to the cancers caused by these diseases as uh, accidents. Uh, the cancers occur in chronically infected individuals, so the viral diseases have to be able to cause chronic infection. The tumors themselves do not contain re replicative viruses, and immunosuppression and cofactors exacerbate oncogenesis in these uh, viruses, uh, and that is primary mechanism by which HIV causes cancer through immunosuppression and then uh, um, oncogenesis from other uh, agents. We'll start with uh, liver cancer. You can correct my French translation at the coffee break. But uh, this is a picture of a gentleman from Senegal who were dying of uh, primary liver cancer. And the way they understood this disease was uh, that a pregnant man delivers in his grave. But uh, scientists uh, believed uh, first that this was primarily caused by aflatoxin exposure from moldy peanuts. But uh, after the, the work of Palmer Beasley in Taiwan showed without question that most of these cancers occurred in people who were carriers of hepatitis B, uh, Philippe Mopa, using a vaccine developed in Tours, uh, decided that he wanted to prove this by uh, uh, preventing cancer, as he said, in the peanut fields of West Africa. And a large study was done uh, there, also a large study done uh, by the MRC in the Gambia and so on, uh, to um, 
start to uh, uh, try to control uh, liver cancer uh, with vaccine. In fact, uh, hepatitis-related um, mor mortality now in the world exceeds that of tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV AIDS. Did you know this? Uh, you know, does this wake you up a little bit? <laughs> most of these deaths are caused by uh, liver cancer and most of them caused by hepatitis B related liver cancer. Certainly in the developing world, the um, hepatitis B causes most of the deaths from liver cancer and cirrhosis. In the industrial world, hepatitis C is a greater cause of uh, death from liver cancer and cirrhosis than hepatitis B. Just wanted to kind of wake you up. Uh, the hepatitis B uh, vaccine prevents the development of the chronic carrier state, which is the precursor to cirrhosis and liver cancer. And there are two paths to oncogenicity. One is a direct oncogenic effect of the virus, and the second is uh, the fact that anything that can cause cirrhosis can then uh, cause um, liver cancer. There are about 880,000 deaths from um, hepatitis B-related cirrhosis and liver cancer in 2015. And it's the number one or two cause of cancer death in men in much of Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia. Um, most infections that actually lead to the chronic carrier state and uh, cirrhosis and cancer uh, occur asymptomatically in the first few years of life from perinatal or horizontal transmission occurring in uh, uh, early childhood. And perinatal infection leads to the carrier state about 90% of the time um, uh, and is responsible for about half of the cancers in Asia, but less in uh, Africa. But the, uh, if you get your carrier state uh, perinatally from your mother, uh, that has a disproportionate likelihood of, of becoming uh, cancer, oncogenic and cancer. In uh, uh, industrial countries, um, most of the infections with hepatitis B occur later in life due to occupational uh, and lifestyle uh, as, uh, infections, but that rarely leads to the carrier state. Sorry. We have been incredibly successful in getting hepatitis B vaccine into the world and it's estimated now that in uh, all regions of the world, um, uh, at least uh, 80 to 85 percent of the children routinely receive three doses of hepatitis B vaccine. This has been uh, uh, one of the great achievements, in my biased opinion, of public health in the 21st century. Why do I keep doing that? In fact, uh, previously, about 5 percent of the children in the world were chronic carriers. And now it's estimated that about 1.3% of the children in the world are chronic carriers. And only in Africa does that uh, number exceed uh, 1%. So in Asia, where most of the carriers and most of the deaths occurred, it's uh, estimated now that a, a less than 1% of children are now chronic carriers of hepatitis B. In China, that number is uh, in one to four-year-olds in the latest Ciro survey, the 2014 Ciro survey, 0.32 percent, and in children under 14 years of age, um, five to 14, it's less than one percent. So hepatitis B has been largely controlled in the immunized cohorts of children in uh, China. The um, universal infant immunization strategy was developed in 1990, and now every country in the world, except four in Northern Europe, who we consider our control group, um, uh, 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 use this vaccine routinely. Most is given now as a quadrivalent, pentavalent, and hexavalent DTP-based combination vaccines. And the trick to get the coverage of hepatitis B up so high was to put it in the same bottle as the DTP, and that sort of automatically got that coverage very high. But uh, giving the vaccine with DTP prevents horizontal transmission, but not perinatal transmission. So our next big target is to uh, knock down the perinatal transmission in these countries. Uh, so the basic strategy to control hepatitis B is first 
to give three doses of hepatitis B vaccine with uh, DTP to reduce the incidence. Then you give a birth dose of vaccine um, uh, and or you test all women for hepatitis B surface antigen and you treat the infants of carrier mothers and you give them vaccine plus HBIG. And the latest um, thing now is to screen, uh, is to take the pregnant women who you find to be carriers and who have high viral loads and to suppress their viral load by giving them tenofovir. This is not yet the uh, WHO official recommendation, but um, uh, it's uh, probably coming in the future. WHO has now declared a target of eliminating hepatitis B as a public health problem by 2030. Uh, and various WHO regions, including the European region, have uh, developed their own targets for WHO elimination. WHO officially calls for a birth dose for every child in the world, but the uh, WHO uh, European region uh, allows countries to either have a routine birth dose or to screen pregnant women for hepatitis B surface antigen and treat infants of carrier mothers uh, or both. And as I said, uh, antiviral drugs given to mothers with particularly high viral loads are, uh, that's sort of coming uh, as the future. In addition, those same antiviral drugs, for example, tenofovir, is highly effective in suppressing the viral load in all carriers. And it's now possible to offer something to chronic carriers of hepatitis B that will suppress the viral replication and uh, pretty much stop the progression to liver cancer and cirrhosis and render them essentially non-infectious. And with hepatitis B, the perception of vaccine safety continues to be an issue. Um, so uh, um, the major uh, region of the world where uh, we really need to focus on the birth dose is now uh, Africa. The coverage in the Western Pacific region and uh, Latin American region is, uh, is, is improving quite a lot but uh, Africa is the place where the birth dose has not yet been widely accepted. And the last issue I want to talk about with hepatitis is the duration of protection issue. Uh, we don't know the duration of protection of hepatitis B vaccine, but we've been following groups out between 25 and 35, uh, in some cases, years. And although the antibody disappears uh, after several decades, the protection does not. So the paradigm that most doctors uh, have in their head that antibody equals protection, that's wrong. It's really um, immune memory uh, in the hepatitis system that protects people for many decades, even after their uh, antibody is gone. Uh, however, um, we're starting to see some subclinical breakthrough infections with anti-core and uh, most vaccinees who have lost their antibody will boost anamnestically if you give them a booster dose of vaccine. But we're starting to see a proportion of children now who aren't boosting. And we don't know what that means because we're not yet seeing clinical disease or development of the carrier state. So we don't know whether we need to be worried or not. I want to talk a little bit about HPV. How much time do I have? Seven minutes. Um, human papillomavirus is responsible for uh, about 100% of cervical cancer and uh, varying proportions of many other cancers. Uh, of course, prior to the availability of the vaccine, uh, women were screened with uh, pap smears and some other tests, and new screening tests are available. But uh, few developing countries screen more than about 10% of their women. So the developing world is going to uh, need to rely pretty much on uh, HPV immunization to control cervical cancer in those uh, countries. Most of the um, um, disease burden now of cervical cancer is in the developing world because of the effectiveness of screening programs in um, the industrial world. However, there are still substantial numbers of cases of cervical cancer deaths in women in North America, Europe, and Australia as well. And to control um, uh, human papillomavirus, we need 
to do not only immunization but also screening and then of course treatment of women who have cervical lesions or cervical cancer. So the world uh, situation is uh, uh, very different in the high income countries and the low and middle income countries. In high income countries, the projected cervical cancer deaths uh, curve is pretty flat. These countries, most of them have pretty fair screening programs and fairly effective immunization programs with some major exceptions. In low and middle income countries, very few of their women are screened or will ever be screened. And so far, immunization coverage with HPV vaccine is quite low. So basically, uh, what's happening in Western um, countries, in, in North America and Europe and so on, is something that people really don't understand. And I think it's kind of a game changer in our thinking about human papillomavirus. So, of course, the HPV causes cervical cancer, but it also causes a lot of uh, other cancers, anal cancer, uh, vulvar, vaginal, and penile cancers. But the real game changer is our understanding of oropharyngeal cancer. That cancer is increasing almost epidemically in um, uh, industrial countries. And because of the effectiveness of screening for cervical cancer in Europe and North America, actually uh, deaths from um, HPV-related cancers not of the cervix now equal or exceed deaths from cervical cancer in these countries. And the big one is oropharyngeal cancer, which is increasing and primarily occurs in males. And in the United States, the uh, oropharyngeal cancer in males is almost equal to cervical cancer in women. So uh, this really changes the equation when we think about whether we're going to use this vaccine only in girls or whether we're going to use it as a gender neutral uh, immunization. Um, this vaccine is uh, extraordinarily effective. In Australia, which had a very effective um, immunization campaign, uh, what we noticed uh, first with genital warts, because genital warts have a short incubation period, you can see the impact long before you can measure it in cancer or high-grade cervical lesions, which take much longer to develop. So in Australia, after a successful uh, immunization campaign, uh, you can see the line in the solid line in blue in women under 21 years of age. There's an incredible decrease in uh, the percentage of the women who come in with uh, genital warts. Now, remember in Australia, only the women got um, vaccines. So, what happened to the men? There was a 93% decrease in genital warts in men. This is herd immunity. This is one of the most dramatic effects of herd immunity. Uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, in the less than 21-year-olds who are most likely to have sex with those young women, but even a measurable effect in the 21 to 30-year-old men as well. So this vaccine has the ability to induce uh, powerful uh, herd immunity. The immunization uptake uh, is uh, more than 100 countries have the vaccine licensed, but effective immunization programs are really uh, only being seen in the lower right side there in uh, the Western Hemisphere, North and uh, South America, Western Europe and Australia. Much of the rest of the world is uh, not uh, uh, being effectively covered with hepatitis B vaccine. Now, a big breakthrough happened when uh, Gavi, do you know, all know about Gavi? Gavi agreed to pay for hepatitis B vaccine for the 53 poorest countries in the world. But what Gavi did was that they first required those countries to have a demonstration project. And those demonstration projects, which are largely successful, and those are countries shown in green, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, um, are over now. They were quite successful. And starting uh, this year, Gavi actually is going to start funding full-blown uh, uh, programs in these poorest countries. The biggest remaining problem with respect to um, uh, getting vaccine into the, the rest of these uh, countries is number one, uh, finance. Um, so the vaccine is uh, relatively affordable to 
wealthy countries in Europe, North America, and Australia. It will be available through Gavi to the poorest countries. So it's the middle income developing countries that really have the most difficulty in paying for the HPV vaccine. And the global community has been uh, not really effective in developing uh, some sort of strategy to allow middle income developing countries to have access to the human papillomavirus vaccine. Um, I think I talked to all this. The um, two remaining major issues with the uh, human papillomavirus vaccine is the first is the discussion of gender neutral immunization. And um, what happened with this vaccine is kind of interesting. We don't have time to talk about it now, but uh, it was basically developed by the OBGYN community, which is a strange community to develop a vaccine. And so they envisioned this vaccine as a cervical cancer vaccine for women. And even the early economic analysis of this vaccine, uh, when they asked the question, should we do male immunization, only looked at it through the lens of does immunizing males prevent cervical cancer? And they actually ignored the significant disease that was occurring in men from this vaccine. Later economic studies, however, uh, do take into account male disease as well. So um, the um, uh, major issue now uh, out there in the meetings and so on is the discussion of gender neutralization. And as I said, this realization that oropharyngeal cancer is a major player I have one more slide. And the last issue, which is a major problem now with human papilloma vaccine uptake, is the uh, perception of safety issues. And a number of countries, including Denmark, Japan, this is data from Colombia showing coverage in Colombia falling from 98% to 14% uh, following uh, uh, mass psychogenic effect and the media amplifying and anti-vaccine groups amplifying the message to parents that this is a, a dangerous vaccine. So uh, in uh, most of the meetings I go to now on HPV, a lot of the discussion or all of the discussion has to do with how to handle the safety issues with respect to uh, perception of safety of the vaccine because the actual data shows that this vaccine is extremely safe and extremely effective. And in fact, it's so immunogenic that there are now studies going on to see whether a single dose of it is uh, all that uh, people need to provide them protection. I, I apologize for going over and thank you very much.